Welcome to the 23rd installment of Biohack the World. Super exciting show this evening. We've got two featured speakers that are going to knock your socks off with science. Dr. Ted Achacoso and Dr. Scott Shear. I'm Dr. Rudy Gehrman, co-host of Biohack the World and... And I'm Avisha Nasaver, also co-host, Chief Science Officer of Biohack the World. And we've got our amazing behind the scenes team here with us tonight. David Choi, our executive producer, and the people who make all this magic happen, Stephen Prasinski and Jordan Crofton. I'm sorry, I keep always thinking it's gonna be Lara Crofton. <laughs> I could imagine you as a Tomb Raider, it'll be great. <laughs> and now Woo! it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker for the night. Ah, Dr. Ted Achacoso is the pioneer of the clinical practice of health optimization medicine. Home, which is the detection and correction of imbalances at the level of the metabolome. He is trained in anti-aging medicine, nutritional medicine, medicinal informatics, artificial intelligence, interventional neuroradiology, I would love to know more about what that actually is, and pharmacology, toxicology. He is based in Washington, D.C., maintains a tricontinental home practice, and performs home lecturing, mentoring, and international corporate consulting activities involving nutritional supplement formulation and the establishment of metabolomics, mitochondria, and microbiota laboratories. And next up is Dr. Scott Scher, board certified internal medicine physician, certified to practice health optimization medicine and a specialist in hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Dr. Scott is a co-founder of HOME in San Francisco, the first home clinic in the United States and also acts as the COO of HOME USA, a non-for-profit company pioneered by Dr. Ted Achacoso that is creating an online home education course for doctors and fellow healthcare providers. Really excited for this evening, uh, but before we kick it off, what's one of our favorite parts of the show, Avisha? Trivia. Trivia time with our one and only Jordan. Jordan, what do you got for us tonight? Hi, everyone. So tonight's winner of trivia will get a $100 gift card towards Daily Dose Market, which offers fresh, ready to eat, organic meal delivery. Oh, we got some music. Uh, so definitely go check them out. And the trivia question is, each time a cell divides, the telomeres get shorter, a process associated with aging and disease. Human cells normally divide around blank times, and each time they divide, average cells lose blank base pairs from the end of their telomeres. And I will post this in the chat after so you don't have to remember it but the options are five to 10 times, 30 to 200 base pairs, 50 to 70 times, 30 to 200 base pairs, 100 to 150 times, and 250 to 500 base pairs, or 100 to 150 times, and 1,000 to 2,000 base pairs. So please send your answer to the panelists. Again, I'll post this in the chat, and good luck, everyone. Dr. Ted and Dr. Scott, I know you guys know your telomere length, so we're going to get personal. You have to uh, uh, tell us what your actual telomere length is by the end of your presentation, if you wouldn't mind, okay? That's a very interesting take <laughs> on the comparing lengths topic. Yes, in absolutely. The, in the biohacking world, sure. <laughs> hey, let's, this is a uh, family show. Let's keep it uh, PG, everybody, okay? So, guys, you're up. What do you have to say? Very interested in uh, uh, you educating us this evening, so... The floor is yours. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, tell them your telomere length, Ted. <laughs> um, I'm, my telomere length is uh, 32 years of age. I'm currently 58. So health That's optimization medicine and practice must have something to do with it. So uh, tonight, um, I'd like to present to you something that I started 11 years ago, health optimization medicine and practice. Home is for doctors and health optimization practice is uh, for healthcare practitioners. And it's a clinical framework for systematic biohacking, something which I call beyond hacking. So I swear, so, um, and I would drop an F-bomb every now and then, so please excuse me. Um, the human body is made up of organs, and uh, we know that. And underneath the organs are specialized cells, for example, your liver cell, your cartilage cell, your nerve cell, etc. And underneath the specialized cells would be the basic cell, which is, comprises of, which is comprised of your nucleus, mitochondria, cytoplasm. 
endoplasmic uh, thickening, cell membrane, etc. Are there tests for organ functions? Yes, there. Uh, and uh, are yes, there are. For example, the liver function test, right? And uh, for specialized uh, cells, are clinical tests for specialized uh, cell functions? Yes, for example, fasting insulin, right? And for but for basic cell, are there tests for um, basic cell function? And yes, uh, we can test the cell basic function through what's called clinical metabolomics. The cells, as we know, they throw off uh, network metabolites, and uh, we can measure them. And the measurement looks something like this. Don't um, get afraid. Uh, Dr. Scott will be explaining this. But on a whole, we now know uh, how to measure what's going on inside your cells in terms of the um, metabolites of your carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. And of course, your Krebs cycle inside your mitochondria. Now, so health optimization medicine and practice takes care of the basic cell, right? Um, so it's like when you go to um, an illness medicine doctor, you already have a flat tire, like you already have heart disease, or you know, you already, your engine is already overheated, like you already have um, infection and you're having a fever. And um, you know, there, there um, uh, what they do is uh, they diagnose you, right? Um, they diagnose you and uh, they um, uh, are actually just going to repair your flat tire, right? Or, or give you a heart transplant, maybe, uh, or um, give you antibiotics for your uh, your infection, right? Uh, so we're in the in a mode of uh, diagnosing and treating diseases here, right? And that's because the dashboard doesn't show any. The da dashboard is retrospective. But now we have modern dashboards available to us, uh, like for example, um, which is used by health optimization medicine. For example, we can see here the, uh, uh, the dashboard uh, can indicate to us uh, tire pressure and uh, engine temperature. And it looks like this, right? And so uh, here you could see this is an actual patient or a client case. Um, where the client has a high need for alpha lipoic acid, B1, B3, B9, etc. And you could see this, um, you know, uh, just as your um, tire pressure is um, uh, decreasing, right? And as your uh, engine temperature is rising. So, in other words, health optimization medicine uh, is like a maintenance for your car where you can top off the oil or you could, uh, you know, uh, put on the windshield. Uh, uh, washer fluid and so on before illness medicine uh, before any illness sets in right so this is another um, uh, dashboard that uh, you can look at you could see now the toxic elements like uh, this uh, client has high mercury and cadmium this is um, an, um, uh, the uh, sensitivity profile this is a uh, a client with uh, severe sensitivities to egg white and egg yolk, uh, moderate sensitivity to cheeses and milk. This right? is yours, and, isn't it, Ted? And, uh, yes, this is mine. Uh, so if you want me to stink up a room, then that's it. Give those to me. So what are the new sensors in the Home Hope dashboard sensing? Right? And what they're sensing are what's called the metabolites in and the omics that's in uh, associated with is the metabolome. These are a set of small molecules that are uh, produced as in metabolic intermediates inside your cell. Now, why did I choose the metabolome for detection in uh, health optimization medicine and practice? It's because in simple terms, you know, you cannot see um, lead or mercury poisoning in the genome. You can get all the genetic tests that you wanted. You can see that you're already getting poisoned, right? So you, the farther you get away from it, you uh, can see the physiological and environmental influences uh, on the client or the patient, and and that's what you'd like to know as a clinician, right? Because it's a home hope is a clinical practice. So for those of you who are enamored with a uh, 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 human genome database, there's actually a human metabolome database that you could browse, right? You could that, uh, search for it online, and in there you could see you know, the metabolite statistics, like endogenous metabolites, food, microbial, drug, plant, toxin, and cosmic metabolites. 
right? And so what are the sources uh, of these metabolites that the home home dashboard is sensing? Uh, and here we use an evolutionary approach and we go away from the um, uh, organ perspective and we use what's called an holobiont perspective. Now we all know that once upon a time, our somatic cells were actually uh, organisms, right? One was an anaerobic organism. The other one was an, aer uh, an aerobic uh, organism that uh, was able to use oxygen to produce um, uh, energy, and they went into a symbiotic relationship, right? And that's why your mitochondria is a double membrane. Um, and so this is how we view the individual. The, in the individual is an uh, ecosystem of network cells. This is how the illness medicine looks at, at the individual. The individual is part of population, population of community, community and ecosystem. And this is because your antibiotic has to work across a population or your vaccine has to work across a population or your surgical technique has to work across a population. But when you're dealing with health, health is a highly individual thing. So we consider the body as the ecosystem itself right? In other words, we're not only biohackers, we're holobiont hackers, right? Now, um, so health optimization medicine and practice detects and corrects metabolite levels in holobiont organisms for health maintenance. Note that I don't say disease prevention. Disease prevention is within the purview of illness medicine. That's why they have vaccines, right? And the, that's, again, there's a population view. So health maintenance is just like your car, you know, it has a reminder that every 3,000 miles or so, you know, you have to bring it for maintenance or that your oil is running low or is getting dirty or your tire pressure um, is, uh, uh, is uh, getting low. And those, the, the tests for those were not available to us before, but now we're able to take a look inside the cells and measure these and now we can actually balance them right so where are this what are these um, uh, molecules that we're detecting they're exogenous metabolites from food microbes drugs plants toxins pollutants cosmetics right and the endogenous metabolites from what i consider as four the four organisms of the human holobiont and these are the anaerobic organism aerobic organism microorganism and a special organism uh, which uh, uh, Scott will discuss. All of these are network metabolites that are detectable and quantifiable. Mm -hmm. That's what we detect, right? Any imbalances in this, we uh, mm -hmm. then correct. Scott? Yeah, thanks, Ted. So we're going to talk about these individual organisms here in just briefly, really. So the first two organisms are the are in, are in each human cell. There's two microorganisms, right? There's the, and Dr. Ted mentioned this already, the anaerobic organism that produces energy via anaerobic respiration, making lactate and pyruvate, or actually coming from uh, pyruvate and making lactate. And you have the mitochondria where the second microorganism, the second organism uh, that's re responsible for aerobic respiration is housed. And the mitochondria, there's at least 10 quadrillion of these in our bodies, powering us up and giving us energy and otherwise known as the batteries of our cells. And we can actually measure these metabolites using the Home Hope dashboard. This particular example is looking at carbohydrates, looking at both metabolites of anaerobic and aerobic metabolism, or the anaerobic and aerobic organism. This is actually what really clued in for me the correlation between the work I do in hyperbaric medicine and the work I do in health optimization medicine. Because if energy, energy metabolism is screwed up, going into a chamber is not going to be very effective or not as effective as it could be. So we can measure these various metabolites. And this is something that Dr. Ted and I and probably others on this call didn't know, know we could actually do in medical school. And knowing that we can actually measure these is actually very powerful. This is another home up dashboard slide looking at vitamin, mineral, and cofactor levels, which we can measure. Uh, we, we often like to ask the question, at least I do, about how many patients or how many people in the audience are taking supplements. Typically, 90% of people are. Maybe 10% of people in the audience know why they're taking what they're taking, as in if they've actually measured levels. 
And so before you ask Dr. Ted or I if you should be taking a B complex, please let us know if you've been measured first. And that, in, that includes antioxidant levels, mineral levels, et cetera. Uh, the next organism is the specialized organism. This is one that produces hormones and cytokines. Specifically here, we're talking about neurotransmitters. So neurotransmitters also work as neurohormones. Specifically, uh, vanilla mandelic acid is, is a metabolite of epinephrine metabolism. Homovanillic acid is a metabolite of, serotonin, of um, dopamine metabolism. And 5-OH uh, indoleacetic acid is responsible or is a metabolite of serotonin metabolism. So these three specifically are responsible for our mood. And the, the balance between the three really are uh, what demonstrates the particular mood we have at that moment. So dopamine responsible for cognitive alertness, norepinephrine responsible for, please go back, thank you. Yes. Um, uh, norepinephrine responsible for vigilant concentration and serotonin sensory satisfaction. So it's these three, they're always working in concert with each other to produce our mood. And that is an example of the power and the importance of neurotransmitter and actually balancing your neurotransmitter metabolites or understanding your neurotransmitter metabolites so you can balance your neurohormones. There are nootropics, uh, which many of you have likely taken on this call. We have one specifically. Uh, Dr. Ted and I are a part of a company called Transcriptions. Some of you may have heard of this particular nootropic called blue canatine. And what's important about blue canatine or any nootropic is that we do this in the context of health optimization medicine. In fact, we have the nonprofit and then we have the for-profit company working in concert because we understand that, that it's so important to have your, be at least on the train, be on the path of health optimization before you're potentially overclocking some of these neurohormones. And of course, examining the ingredients is also really important. In our particular company, we examine uh, for uh, certifications of analysis for each of our ingredients. We have pharmaceutical grade products as well, like methylene blue and nicotine, and precision of dosing, of course. You want to know what you're getting every single time. Because again, you're looking at this in the context of your own foundational health, which we call health optimization medicine. And then the mechanism of action of each ingredient, you know, how these affect neurotransmitters is really important. You don't want to be taking fish tank cleaner, which is how methylene blue is sometimes used to clean fish tanks. We don't use that kind of methylene blue. We use pharmaceutical grade methylene blue. We use CBD that's hemp derived and with a certificate of analysis. So you really wanna know not only nootropics that you're taking like blue canatine, but any supplement or any other product that you're taking, you know, what are you taking and why? And also understanding the greater context of your foundational health and making sure you're not overclocking your system. And then of course, titrating your, do your dose to performance. And so, like Dr. Ted only needs a quarter trochee of blue canatine to have his brain feel limitless. And others may need more uh, if they're not as health optimized potentially, or if lean body mass is higher, we do notice that you may need a higher dose in that capacity as well. This also is the case in hyperbaric therapy, I should mention. You have to titrate the dose to the, what the patient is actually going to be able to tolerate and to be optimized for taking. So it's really important to understand um, foundational levels of vitamins, minerals, nutrients, cofactors, and neurohormones as well. The next organism is the microorganism. This is our gut, and this is a, uh, one of our dashboard slides looking at urine metabolites of malabsorption, bacterial dysbiosis, and yeast dysbiosis. DHPPA is associated with autistic spectrum disorder. Arabinose, just an example, is a, a yeast dysbiosis marker. These are the metabolites that we use along with what's on the next slide, which are actual shit related <laughs> tests, uh, looking in your poop and looking to see what's actually happening. These are uh, real tests uh, for one of our clients uh, with salmonella infection, inflammatory markers that were elevated, uh, insufficiency, uh, not digesting fats or proteins well, and an imbalance in beneficial bacteria and short chain fatty acids. And so we can use all this information to create a health optimization and practice plan for our clients to optimize their gut, fun gut function and their cellular function at the same time. Some really cool stuff happening. Uh, I learned about the gut brain axis in medical school, but now it's actually the enteric microbiota gut brain axis. And this is because the microorganisms, the microbiota themselves are actually having significant interplay with our 
brains as well as the intestinal milieu as well. This is just one example uh, how gut bacteria and uh, anxiety are linked and how the bacteria in our gut are also associated with, with other neurologic symptoms as well, even schizophrenia, autistic spectrum disorder, even heart disease, and maybe even COVID is what I hear. So there's lots of interesting interplays here that are, that are being borne out in the literature. And finally, for me, there is a networked endosymbiont and exosymbiont relationship. The endosymbionts are our mitochondria. Dr. Ted was talking about the eukaryotic cell before. These are our own little bacteria that are creating energy, but they're also interplaying. They have a significant interplay with our commensal bacteria. Here you can see the commensal bacteria have an effect on our mitochondria via various factors, including microRNAs, which is a very significant epigenetic stimulus as well and how that shifts our DNA expression. And then on the mitochondria side, we have uh, the interplay also going back into the commensal bacteria colonies and controlling pathogens, active, activating inflammation or inflammasomes and maintaining gut barrier integrity. Back to you, Dr. Ted. All right. So this is a summary slide of uh, musician medicine versus um, illness medicine. So when you go to an illness medicine doctor, they check disease mass markers, for example. If they're suspecting uh, diabetes, then they will take your fasting blood sugar, right? Um, and so they, they diagnose and treat disease. But the story is that you don't really get sick just right away. It's actually a series of uh, things that happen. And you can detect that way beforehand, um, any imbalances beforehand before they become florid diseases. So, uh, for example, uh, in genetics, we have nuclear DNA, mitochondrial DNA, and nucleic acids. For the symbiotic partners, we have your mitochondria and uh, gut microbiota. For your environment, uh, you have direct signals for your environment, indirect signals for your environment. And with time, there's evolutionary time and circadian time. Now, um, all of these gears that you see here, they throw off metabolites that then you can detect the early, early onset of uh, metabolic de deregulations, right? And this is the practice of health optimization medicine. It's to detect and correct imbalances, which is different from illness medicine, which is for diagnosis and treatment of disease. Now, uh, to measure the biomarkers, we, we use diagnostic metabolomics. And for um, uh, the management, we use therapeutic metabolomics. For example, if you need alpha lipoic acid, etc. We give those to you. Now, if you want to affect the uh, genetics, then you use the science of epigenetics. If you want to affect the mitochondria and gut microbiota, you use the sciences of bioenergetics and the gut immune system. If you want to affect the direct and indirect signals from the environment, you use the science of exposomics. And if you want to affect uh, evolutionary uh, and circadian time, then use the sciences of evolutionary medicine and chronobiology. So these are the seven pillars of um, uh, health optimization medicine and practice. It's metabolomics, epigenetics, bioenergetics, gut immune system, exposomics, chronobiology, and evolutionary medicine. So we said health optimization medicine. So let's just go through it one by one. And I give this in every presentation that I have. Here's a simple definition of health. Health is an optimal physiologic state characterized by A, the absence of disease, and the maintenance of B, the balance between anabolism and catabolism according to C, the cycle of life of the organism. So health equals A plus B plus C. But what about, uh, so A is uh, uh, absence of disease is the purview of illness medicine, right? and the balance between the anabolic and catabolic processes according to the life cycle of the organism is health optimization medicine. Now, here's uh, optimization, right? Uh, the clinical practice is very simple. One, two, three, measure the levels of metabolites compared to optimal ranges, meaning the ranges when you were between 21 to 30 years old or the evolutionary range like as for vitamin D. Uh, right, and then you balance using network wide range shifting, meaning you cannot just shift a single value. Uh, for example, you cannot just give testosterone without changing all the other values in the network. So, um, medicine 
um, is balancing the metabolomic subnetworks subnetwork, sub optimal levels. And our first line in Home Hope is using bioidenticals, uh, the same thing that the body uses, like for example, uh, five methyl tetrahydrofolate um, and um, uh, bioactives, uh, uh, those that are, that are already immediately um, uh, used by the, can be immediately used by the body, right? Um, second line would be uh, phytoceuticals, fungiceuticals, bacteria, and phages. The reason why botanicals here at the second line is that it's really difficult to um, to regulate the quality of your phytoceuticals. So for, we first use what the body uses to uh, balance itself out before we aid them with uh, phytoceuticals, fungiceuticals, bacteria, and phages. The um, uh, an example of the bacteria would be your live probiotics, for example. A third line would be synobiotics, right? The drugs that are nev have never been encountered by the body uh, during evolution. And that's why it's the uh, last in line here. So uh, in short, illness medicine diagnosis and treats disease, health optimization medicine and health optimization practice detects and corrects imbalances. Currently, the imbalances are corrected at the level of metabolome, for example, nutrients and hormones. And it's a level of metabolome because it's what currently we can see, right, and, and test. So home hope is not functional medicine. It's a common question that's asked. Functional medicine may serve as an illness medicine's bridge to home hope because functional medicine still deals with illness, but they use functional met methods also for their diagnostics. Now, the clinical practice of health optimization medicine, uh, essentially in illness medicine, we have allopathic medicine, Western medicine as we know it, alternative medicine, compl complementary medicine, integrative medicine, functional medicine. All of these are illness medicine um, uh, within the illness medicine, right? And health optimization medicine is simply detection of the borderline deficiencies and subtle toxicities and shifting them back to the optimal uh, physiologic values. Now, so illness medicine is diagnosis and treatment of disease. Health optimization medicine is the detection and correction of imbalances. Um, illness medicine deals with disease management. Health optimization medicine deals with health management. Illness medicine deals with lifespan right? The, the way they test the effectivity of their regimen is by their uh, five-year mortality rates. Health optimization medicine is after health span, so we're after the quality of life. So at homehope.org, we have the uh, seven pillars. The clinical metalomalomics has already been released last year. If, uh, for those of you who wish to take it, then it, it provides uh, 45 CME credits if you need it. Chronobiology and exposomics are actually coming out at the end of August. Epigenetics has already been released and it's um, uh, qualified for 45 CME credits. Um, evolutionary medicine um, is uh, coming out uh, at the end of August as well. Uh, the gut immune system is coming out at the end of this week. Uh, it's uh, for 45 CME credits as well. And bioenergetics has already been released with 38 CME credits. So that's what we have, um, uh, the gist of health optimization, medicine, and practice. Hey, can one of you, if you wouldn't mind, break down those kind of silos of, of education, uh, just in the almost like third grade language? What, what is metabolomics? What is exposomics? Yes. What is epigenetics? Not everybody understands what that is. So, no, all good. Uh, they're, and they're good questions. You know, metabolomics, is the study of metabolites. Is that helpful? <laughs> yes. So all, when we're looking at a cell real time, all the things that are being made by the cell, you know, vitamins, vitamin products, nutrient products, or mineral products, um, you know, magnesium, potassium, you can measure all these in real time. And these are not just metabolites coming from internally, but also externally as well. So Dr. Ted had a slide where he showed what's called, um, what is the slide that he used that he talks about it? Um, where you basically you have it's all network metabolites everything that's coming from inside and outside so exogenous metabolites from food microbes drugs plants toxins pollutants and cosmetics and endogenous metabolites coming from these four organisms that we went through so we can measure either themselves directly or metabolites of so breakdown products of each of these various exogenous and endogenous metabolites using metabolomics 
that's probably, I hope that's a helpful way of describing. So Perfect. metabolomics, basically everything from a urine test as opposed to metabolites typically being more of a blood test situation. No, no, metabolomics is the study uh, you use or, both sorry, blood, yeah. blood and yeah. urine. Urine analytes. Yeah, and, and, and the metabolites and coming too. in from stool as well. Stool and stool right? as Because well. they throw, sure. this stool throws off metabolites. And uh, for uh, Jordan here, especially the fastest uh, growing uh, metabolite segment is uh, coming in from cosmetics. So um, they also get absorbed from your skin and there are um, uh, cosmetic metabolites in there. Aside from, of course, uh, toxins uh, and so on. Those are, those are um, actually, uh, that's why we measure uh, all of those levels, right, that are being thrown off or uh, by the cell, be they coming from, in terms of origin, from the exterior, right, as, as in toxins, or, um, or the interior, like your um, uh, intermediate severe Krebs cycle, or the um, uh, cofactors that are needed to move the Krebs cycle forward, like your B vitamins, um, and, and so on. So you can measure those. Um, so you, we know that the body cannot manufacture vitamins uh, and the minerals and cofactors, uh, essential minerals and cofactors. That's why you need to take them in, right? So now you don't, you don't need to guess uh, or ask us, uh, do I need some vitamin E? Because I would just going to ask you to take a test and see whether or not you need it. Because the technology exists. You, mean, you can't just look at someone and say that you know exactly what vitamins they need? <laughs> Well, we can tell that, vitamin D that, often. <laughs> I, I, if, if, I, if I had a woo-woo stick, you know, that would be great. Like a tricorder and say, hey, you know, you got this. I'll have to send you one. It'll be great. <laughs> Epigenetics, Scott? Oh, sure. I got, I got sidetracked. You were just going there, Ted. Um, so epigenetics is the study of how our environment controls the expression of our genetic code. And so most of us know that we have a genome, but that's pretty static. What's not static is how those genes are transcribed. And so we have released a module that describes epigenetic markers, um, also looking at you know, various ways to, uh, to, in, to adjust or to shift your epigenetics to be more optimally uh, for, like, from a health perspective. So from, um, from an Aubrey de Grey standpoint, I know who you guys know who he is, right? He's a famous biogerontologist. He says that, you know, we pass through these optimal stages and then there's this stage uh, of time where we, we experience all these chronic diseases, right? Uh, diabetes and uh, heart disease and uh, neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and, and so on, and then we die, right? Is it possible to make the cells young again such that it doesn't have to pass through that phase of chronic disease? Right, and of course, uh, there's been the findings uh, of the Nobel laureate, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Yamanaka on the Yamanaka factors and making the cells young again. And the what I like is the, what's used by David Sinclair in ep epigenetics. He compares it to like dental plaque. Right, you accumulate all of this dental plaque, and uh, in in terms of age reversal medicine now, what ca what can we do in order to remove or erase that dental plaque or the epigenetic markers that have been accumulated and screwed up just aging yourself and backwards and um, as of now you know those uh, techniques are working for example in restoring um, uh, cells the retinal cells in, that are had been damaged in macular degeneration for example in the retina right so we are in the era of no longer anti-aging but we're in the era of uh, age reversal and that is uh, yeah. uh, closely really tied up with our health because if we could move the, the age of our cells, right, epigenetically to a younger age, then those uh, diseases would, the chronic diseases would likely not come up. So the study of epigenetics is still pretty young as compared to the study of a lot of these metabolomics and nutritional factors. Are there tests now that you can go and get and say, oh, this is the state of my epigenetics and I can make like concrete interventions based on that? He is an epigenetic age. He is disappointed. <laughs> so there's some new, new testing companies that are out now looking at epigenetic age. One of them, if I can mention, is it's called DNAge, DNA age. And it's looking at the work that was done by a guy named Stephen Horvath and Horvath Clock. If you're not familiar with his research or what he's done, he basically was able to, to figure out several different clocks, one of them being um, our epigenetic clock or our chronologic versus biologic clock. He also was able to 
figure out something called the time to, uh, to, uh, to illness. It's called the Grim Age clock. And there's a couple other clocks that have been developed. But these are coming out. These are probably your new telomere age. Actually, probably better than looking at your telomere age, but looking at epigenetic markers is the next generation of how we're going to be assessing chronologic versus biologic age. And you're right, Dr. Ted, yes, I did do my DNA age test recently, <laughs> and I wasn't terribly excited with my results given it was my age. At least it wasn't worse than my age. We'll take that, but um, have some options. You're saying you've got some work to do under uh, yeah, that's all good, right? supervision. It's all good, but the idea is you can, you can check these kinds of tests before and after doing interventions. And so the work that yeah. we do in health optimization medicine in practice is not for short-term gain, it's for long-term gain. And so we're not looking at what's gonna to happen tomorrow. One of the things that Dr. Ted likes to say, and others have said it too, is that you can't expect you know, overnight to change 40 years of your existence and start feeling better the next day. It's, it's a process. And this is something that as clinicians, all of us have to manage expectations unless they're taking something else that might be more of an acute, an acute enhancer like a nootropic or something like that, like glucanotine, or things that maybe not be legal in this country. Uh, but you know, otherwise we're talking about a sustainable health path here. And that's what, when we're looking at epigenetics, we're looking at something like DNA age. It's also looking at methylation markers as well. Methylation status is a, is a new and upcoming field and how you can assess it. And so we're starting to integrate some methylation markers and methylation testing in, into our protocols as well. So I guess the epigenetic age would be the equivalent of standing on a scale saying, oh, this is good, this is bad, but we're still working now on the methylation factors to get the added granularity to make it a prescriptive type of measurement. The, the Horvath clock is a methylation clock, right? Um, yes. it's, a, it's a methylation clock. So, um, but the, the one that hasn't been released yet, which I would like to, to see, um, I already rejoice that the the uh, Horvath clock uh, was released, right? Because now you can hold the illness medicine doctor. It's like, hey, this is the protocol that you gave me a deceased person. And this is how much you actually reduced or advanced my epigenetic age. And it also, for me, it's used by us in health optimization. And this is by how much we actually reduce your genetic age. So it's Aside from putting in your metabolite levels between 21 and 30 years old and calling that, yeah, here's your proof, here's another, uh, another test that you can take, right? So now um, you, you're ho if the, these tests are holding uh, a candle on the feet of uh, illness medicine doctors to perform better. Like, look, you put me on this medication and suddenly, you know, I am, I am, I am 32 and my epigenetic age is 72. You know, you can... Hallelujah, praise the Lord. <laughs> You know, there was a study published last week that actually just showed the, I think it was last week, showed the link between COVID outcomes and that actual biologic age as compared with your actual age. And they showed that the, the, the negative outcomes as you get older are based on that sort of biologic age rather than your actual birthday. So we know that this is something that actually matters and is relevant right now. The other interesting part, the clock that was not released is the grim age clock, as Scott mentioned. This is time to your first morbidity it's time to your first heart attack. Uh, and it's that predictive. What they did was they did, uh, they, they, they superimposed the smokers data from uh, 2000 um, uh, participants in the Framingham Heart Study. And they found out that it could be generalized into the population. And that's a little bit more scary, but it's actually fear that drives people to take care of their health, yeah. right? It's, it's, it's sort of like a, one of the most powerful leaders shit, I have just, you know, two years for my first heart attack as predicted by the Grim Age clock. And although they haven't commercialized it yet, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful motivator for you to actually go and take care of your health. So the, the other pillars uh, are, the, the other ones have to do with microorganisms. One is with bioenergetics, which is mitochondria, right? Uh, and uh, this is the aerobic part, uh, an, uh, uh, an aerobic organism, which which uh, produces uh, energy with the use of uh, oxygen, right? They produce your ATP, they power up your entire body. And of course, it's the subject of why you do intermittent fasting, right? Um, uh, you know, uh, if you fast for about 12 hours or so, then the bacteria, the mitochondria will divide and uh, to, to provide you fresh mitochondria that can generate energy for you, right? And, and um, um, it, it, this is also the reason why you know, uh, when you go on a ketogenic diet, right, uh, the, the fats are actually, um, if you have a 
eight carbon uh, feeding, then it goes directly through the mitochondrial double membranes without uh, ever having to be shuttled uh, with uh, acetylcarnitine, yes, and uh, doesn't have to have to be used by ruvit dehydrogenase, so, and, and provides you direct energy. And so that's the bio, bioenergetics uh, section. And uh, then Doc, before another you get organism off that, would be... Before you get off uh, that, what is your fast? How many hours are you fasting per day? And uh, are you six, doing it seven days per week? Uh, 16. 16. What's your first meal of the day? It's at noon, and it's noon. all fat. Seven days a week? Yes. Dr. Scott, can you answer that question? Um, I typically do a, a longer fast, about three days per quarter. And then I'm doing intermittent fasting about five times a week, three to five times a week, depending on the day. I have little kids in my house, and sometimes I just want to have some yogurt with nuts. Totally understood. <laughs> I hear you. I've got a little one myself. But do you make your own yogurt yet? No, no. Yeah, you have four kids and tell me if you make your own yogurt. I just buy it at the store. <laughs> um, if we can pause, we have a question from the audience and I would love to get back to the education silos. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Jordan, what do we got from the audience? Jump in here. We have a lot of questions coming in. So one from Natasha. Um, she says, it looks like you're feeding in Nutra eval lab tests into your dashboard. What other tests are you using? Scott? Looks yeah, like Genova sure. uh, stool testing as well. Yeah, so you know, we don't have a preference in the sense that we are an educational company. Uh, we use the Genova tests, the GI effects, the, the allergics, and the NutriVal with plasma amino acids. We're also looking at some of the other tests like I discussed, the DNA age testing, some methylation testing also by Genova, but some other companies. And uh, we work with other companies as well. The education company that we have is, is we're agnostic on one level. We do have a relationship with Genova because we do really think that their NutriVal especially has some really great data that we really can't find in other tests out there, at least that I couldn't find. If anybody has suggestions, I'm, I'm, I'm always all ears to, as, as Ted is as well. Um, have you looked the, the spectra cell tests at all? The what? The spectra cell? Yeah, the spectra, yeah. spectra cell is good for micronutrients, but it's not as good for um, the energy metabolites. It's not as good for, it doesn't do plasma amino acids or fatty acid, fatty acid oxidation. Yeah. Um, so there, there's parts of it that are good. Um, there's, but also, there's also a history. Um, you know, um, uh, it, it, it used to be called Metametrics, right? Metametrics Laboratory. It was bought by Genova. And I knew uh, the guy who started Metametrics, and it really was built as a clinical metabolomics lab. So if you look at their history, they're really the oldest ones around in terms of data gathering and uh, instrumentation and so on. And that's where I got used to reading stuff, right? Then the other ones like ZRT labs, you know, and their blood drop tests for, for hormones, et cetera. They're all, you know, you can just, uh, you, you can use whatever you want. It's just that that's what we're used to using and they have the longest history uh, in terms of the metabolomics. Yeah, those that get certified through our program, we do have discounts available uh, for those that are actually using Genova testing in their own uh, in their own practices. So we felt strongly because of that relationship that Dr. Ted has had for many years and that I've been using for the last several years as well. But again, any, uh, we're not you know, married to these tests for others. And really, we know that across the world, not everything is going to be accessible. So uh, finding what's best in your neck of the woods is, is going to have to be the, the idea, depending on where you are. Makes sense. Um, we have a question from Ronald. He, he asked, are you measuring senescent cells? Now, there's not really a good way to measure senescent cells as far as I'm aware yet. Um, people can sort of see them kind of come and go from like a, uh, not, from, not from a clinical perspective, but more from a research side. That's how, how I understand it, Ted. Is that right? Yeah. Um, senescent cells are, are a difficult thing because there's a, uh, there's a certain number of them that has to be present before they can actually be detected. Um, it's, it's um, uh, one of the things that uh, I, I remember uh, when discussing senescent cells is like a, a friend of mine who is a, a sinologist, you know, a, a breast cancer expert, said I could do a needle biopsy of the breast today and you would have cancer because I poked a cancer cell, but I will do that same procedure tomorrow and I'll poke you and I'll declare you cancer free. And that's the current status of the detection of senescent cells, right? Any more, Jordan? 
And we have a few questions coming in around the actual certification process. Can you just touch briefly on what that looks like, how long it takes, how providers can go through that, that process? Yeah, sure. Uh, so Dr. Ted mentioned we have seven modules for our basic certification in health optimization medicine and practice. You can be both a physician or a healthcare provider. Uh, we do have a separate tracks, although the education is very similar for those that are medical practitioners or have DEA, DEA licenses and those that don't. Um, we have the health optimization medicine track and the health optimization practice home and hope tracks. Uh, we know that doctors tend to be the bottlenecks, at least medical doctors, chiropractors, acupuncturists, naturopaths. Uh, there are more and more especially that are interested in the framework that we're describing here. And, and actually we're seeing that to be the case. We, we're thinking that's gonna be the case going forward. So we wanted to make a separate track just for health optimization practitioners as well. So right now, as Dr. Ted mentioned, we have about 70% of the modules done and we'll have about 30% the rest, hopefully by the end of next month. So each of the modules can be taken on their own. In fact, the first one, metabolomics, can be taken for its own special certification if you don't wanna take the rest of the modules. We have a lot of practitioners that we've talked to over the last couple of years that really are interested in metabolomics only, actually, and that's completely okay. So we've decided to actually separate, a, separate out a certification just for metabolomics. But in general, we have the seven module certification. Each module is its own price, uh, depending on how many weeks it will take to complete it. Each module has CME so far, and all will have an, a, basically a, an assessment or test at the end that you need to pass as well. So essentially, if you finish all the modules, then you receive a certificate of completion for each module. But for clinical metabolomics, you, you, if you apply for it uh, with certain requirements, then you, uh, you can also have a certificate to practice, right? All of these uh, are actually in homehope.org, all the details of how that's done. And if you finish all uh, of the modules and you have to pass uh, another exam to certify as a health optimization medicine, uh, doctor or as a health optimization uh, practitioner, right? If, you, if you're a non-doctor and you will be certified to practice. Uh, we are a clinical um, uh, practice, a clinical framework. So everything is case-based, right? Uh, because uh, all of the modules are uh, structured such that if a client is in front of you, what are you going to do? And that's the perspective of all the modules. And you see the didactics are actually hidden. You can dig through the rabbit hole as far as you can. But the, the thing for you is like, how do I detect these things? What do I use? And how do I correct the imbalances? So that's, that's the point of view of all of the modules that you're going to see is clinical. And, and also to describe that this is a virtual practice. It doesn't require you being in person with your clients really at any time to do the work that we're doing here. And I think you have a tagline for it, Ted. What is it? <laughs> I, I, you know, no, I, 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 just, I just finished a podcast with someone when I said, you cannot say, hello, um, Crab Cycle, how are you feeling today? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you for that, Docs. Hey, if we can maybe address the accessibility question, um, obviously our avatar in functional medicine, when we start looking at all this testing, it's quite expensive, and unfortunately, there's a lot of people that are kind of stuck in the middle. They're paying for very expensive commercial insurances, and most of the time, insurance companies don't offer uh, all of this testing. So how, are, how is your organization going to kind of come up with some solutions for accessibility? And obviously, as healthcare providers, our goal is to, and our purpose is to treat as many people as possible. But um, we found in our own clinic that we have a specific demographic. So do you have any solutions? Is your company looking into any solutions? Right now, you know, clinical metabolomics testing is really expensive. It's because it's a, you know, as any laboratory owner would tell you, it's a question of volume, right? The more, yeah. the more, that's why our, our, initial, um, uh, our initial goal is to educate as many clinicians as possible who can use these tests, prescribe them, so that all these uh, uh, tests will actually go down in price, right? Um, yeah. And then, and then you could see that then there, then it's easier to act, actually uh, bring down the price and um, and uh, deliver this to a wider audience. It's just like my 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 line uh, for this is like 
when you had an MRI before when it was new, right? You were paying four thousand dollars a pop per per, but you went through and got the test, right? So it went yeah. down to two thousand dollars, and then a thousand, and then six hundred, and now it's like four hundred bucks, right? So we are following the same curve with uh, all of these types of tests. They are expensive now, but we are going to see, uh, you know, uh, with with increased use, you know. Um, uh, uh, decline in those prices and we need people actually to, to train and you know to train in using yeah. in, in using this properly and then prescribe them so that we they have the necessary volume to bring the prices down and are you starting to treat in programs and if so what what is the cost of those programs so i can answer that i mean so yes i mean we have programs in the u.s here that i run through my clinic in san francisco we're training some practitioners, one that's down in Atlanta, um, another uh, practitioner that's actually over in Europe as well, and we have a lead in Australia as well. So um, each of us have their, our own way of practicing. So that's the nice thing about this, this, this framework is that you bring it into your practice the way it makes the most sense for you. And in my capacity, it's as a hyperbaric clinician with a foundation optimization strategy using health optimization medicine. And so yeah. that's how I do it, although I do just the home framework or just hyperbaric medicine as well. But for me, it's, um, that's how I, 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 I develop my programs within the context of my own practice. And that's what we're gonna find as more clinicians are getting certified and doing this as well. Got it, thank you. I would just make a suggestion. Um, we we kind of treat in our office the three T's, test, treat, teach. I'd like to add that third T to track. I think all of our organizations in terms of accessibility, we should put it, be putting in a common registry to kind of force more accessibility and force commercial insurances uh, to now adopt these types of programs. And obviously, uh, you know, uh, tracking artificial intelligence, I know Avisha's chomping at the bit to ask some AI questions. Well, you know, but, uh, you just mentioned the letter T as treat. We don't treat. Uh, that's function. That's a functional medicine of you that that um, does that. Is that a swear we, word? I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> we 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 test balance, right? Test and we balance. Test bal balance and confirm, right? TBC. So, okay, TBCT yes. is the new word of the day. Right. <laughs> Got it. Thank you for Go correcting ahead. me. I like that. Thank you. I think it's good too, though. So avoid even getting to the point of treatment. I actually like to think about it as like you're in a canoe on a river, and as you start going a little bit off stream, you just want to push it back before you ever get to the bank where you have to deal with all the annoying doctors. But going back to the uh, the very beginning, which is your bio, Doctor Ted. I know it listed so many things that people could barely even actually pay attention <laughs> to all of them. But one of those was artificial intelligence, and when I see these type of labs spitting out hundreds of different biomarkers, it's great to be able to train physicians to understand them all and try to use them to guide some type of program to enhance our health. But where do you see us going when it comes to the human interaction alongside the computer-guided diagnoses to actually improve health on a larger scale going forwards? Um, the honest opinion? You know, we will see ourselves eliminated uh, pretty soon by artificial intelligence and robotics. Look, um, for example, in, in um, a test between pathologists and an actual AI system determining whether or not there are cancer cells in a slide, you know, the artificial intelligence system actually beat the pathologists. Uh, so, and, and in terms of um, uh, robotic surgery, you know, the, the um, uh, surgeons, you know, they age and they're now like, uh, you know, you're using robotic surgery to control the, the, the hands that, uh, that shake, right? So pretty soon they're actually better at planning, for example, um, a surgery of tumors and, and so on and so forth. So in illness medicine, you see uh, a lot of this uh, getting replaced. And in the interpretation of these things, uh, you know, I see, uh, you know, various types of uh, different artificial intelligence systems. I was uh, discussing this with Scott uh, the other day. You know, initially probably they would have some expert systems going, right? That if-then type of expert systems, the algorithmic type of medicine 
that we do, then afterwards we could shove this into our neural network systems, like the deep learning systems that we, we have now, and they could determine the patterns, you know, uh, among all of those things. Now, well, we can get access to that data. You, humans being humans, right? Humans being humans. And, uh, you know, we, and this is since I practice also in Manila, you know, 30 days a recorder, um, it's like, they do need someone to be there, right? They need a face, they need a hand to hold, you know, they need to see uh, someone that's there who exerts some knowledge and authority over what's going on, right? Uh, um, but in truth, you know, you probably, uh, uh, if, if in the future all of this is uh, done by artificial intelligence and you compare what I know with what that artificial intelligence has been fed with, you know, um, uh, billions and billions of data points, it prob probably can make better decisions than I do based on this unique set of data points that I have. So, and that will make the individualization uh, of, of uh, health, you know, optimization, uh, you know, a, a lot more really bespoke for what you need, right? Uh, so you could see this tied into dispensers, into your home, you know, you need the following vitamins, et cetera, et cetera, and you find one morning, they're all already uh, uh, arrayed there for you, for you to take. So this is where we're going. It's still, uh, we, I have already seen some of those automatic dispensers, you know, based on um, automatic urine tests, based on your toilets, right? Japan is big on this. They're big on toilets. So anyway, um, but the, some of these are already there, right? Um, and, and so we could only see but a, a, a progression of this. But the thing is, it also tied in what you just asked earlier, how is this going to drive the cost of this, right? So initially it's going to be probably a lot more expensive and then it will, uh, as, 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 the, as the more and more data accumulate, then you could see that um, uh, the prices will go down. So it, it has to follow, it usually follows that kind of history. Well, we can hope it goes even faster. Well said, we got yeah, room Yeah, you wanna for get rid more... of me, I know. Yeah. We got room for one more question. Dr. Scott, I have to ask, I've been following you on podcast and you're uh, giving me great information uh, for the use of my hyperbaric chamber. Um, I view it as a tool. I view it as a very useful tool in my own health and our patients' health at our clinic. Can you give a couple of uh, clinical indications? Obviously, you have a lot of tools in your toolbox with home. When do you use it and what conditions? Well, thanks, Rudy. That's nice of you to say. I would say that, well, there's 14 indications that are covered by insurance, right? There's 14 indications that if you have Medicare or private insurance in the, U in the U.S., you will get covered if you have these particular conditions. The ones that are most common that we see on the outpatient side are diabetic foot ulcers that aren't healing, radiation injury from cancer treatment, uh, sudden hearing loss, neurologic usually, and usually unexplained reason why you lose your hearing, flaps and grafts. So these are grafts or flaps that are put on, putting, they're put on during a plastic surgery, for example, and they look like they're not gonna be taken by the particular tissue. Yeah. And then the last one is, uh, is osteomyelitis or chronic bone infections. So vastly underutilized for all those conditions and I work in clinic in a clinic here in San Francisco, and I consult with clinics around the, the world really that use uh, hyperbaric therapy for these particular indications. And then I'm also very much involved in what are called the investigational indications, those that are not covered by insurance yet, but have significant data to back up their use. Probably the biggest of those would be neurological right now. Uh, we, we're talking traumatic brain injury, especially what we call post-concussive syndrome, so three months after and a concussion if, if symptoms aren't better. Hyperbaric therapy can be fantastically helpful. Also, patients post-stroke, three months to three years has been the studies. Also looks like even an acute stroke and acute traumatic brain injury can actually significantly benefit from getting into a chamber. I like to say that if there's an acute injury, hyperbaric therapy is likely going to help it heal faster by just getting more oxygen to the tissue, decreasing inflammation, helping with stem cell release, killing any bugs that might be around and regenerating yeah. tissue really. So. Uh, and then if there's a more of a long-term issue, it's really about understanding that foundational health first, if possible. So that's when health optimization medicine comes in for me. If it's an acute injury, I just throw shit at the wall and try to help people get better as fast as yeah. I can. But if it's more, uh, obviously, an educated throwing shit at the wall. So if yeah. that makes sense. The only way to do it. <laughs> Educating. Yes. Educated shit wall throwing is what I do in medicine <laughs> um, in San Francisco. And then- uh, Do you offer a degree in that as well, the eighth pillar? 
that's going to be yeah the ninth. We are we we're, the eighth pillar. Dr. Ted's already figured out it's going to be <laughs> how to get to intergalactic space without moving an inch. <laughs> yes. Excellent. How to be in the safest place to be out here in outer space. <laughs> Perfect. Well, good news. We're at uh, the trivia portion. Jordan, who won the trivia? All right. So the answer to the trivia question was B. Um, human cells normally divide around 50 to 70 times, and each time they divide, the average cells lose anywhere from 30 to 200 base pairs from the end of their telomeres. And our winner, the first person to submit the correct answer, was Hindi. So congrats to Hindi. You get $100 towards the Daily Dose Market which is the Tri-State's premier organic meal delivery service. Their food's amazing. Um, so I, I, I'm assuming you will really enjoy that. Hindi Tantoko Weber, I know you. <laughs> <laughs> and I am going Your to- producer, biohack the world. Back to All David right. now. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. I had so much fun listening in on that. We had everything from AI to toilet humor and uh, everything in between. So thank you so much. Um, and thank you all for joining us tonight. As always, we're so honored by your pre presence, your time, and attention. Please do check out our website, www.biohackthe.world, for all the latest news and updates. And watch some of our videos on Biohacker TV. There's also info on our next event, which will be exactly one week from today, Thursday, July 23rd at 8 p.m. with the one and only Dr. Mark Hyman and Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams, who's also running for 2021 in uh, the mayoral election. He's the leading mayoral candidate. And we're going to host a virtual dinner, uh, fundraising dinner, and we're going to discuss how we're going to transform New York City into the healthiest big city in the world. We really do think that it's possible. And if there's any city that deserves it, it's us. So um, dinner will be provided by Daily Dose. Uh, everyone, all guests are gonna have an amazing organic meal delivered to your door if you're living in New York City. And I just can't wait to host this badass dinner party with all of you guys. You will not wanna miss this. And if this episode spoke to you, please do share it with a friend or two, and leave a positive review. Also, do remember to connect with us on social media, sign up for our amazing weekly newsletter, and um, thank you. Until next week, stay hungry, stay safe, and good night. <laughs>